On this Wednesday night, the Tories turn on their leader. Aaron O'Toole is voted out by the Federal Conservative Caucus. This country needs a Conservative Party that is both an intellectual force and a governing force. Who will take over and can the fracture in the party be fixed? Patience wears thin with the blockades disrupting lives in Ottawa and Alberta. When will the police act? And they're trying to say that this is a peaceful protest? It's not very peaceful to me. The U.S. bolsters its military presence in Eastern Europe, waiting for Moscow's next move. And the remarkable life and work of a Canadian scientist and professor. I wouldn't be where I am now if it wasn't for Jeff. He was a mentor to new scientists and a fierce defender of facts. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. We begin with a big political upheaval in Ottawa. Aaron O'Toole has lost his grip on the federal Conservative Party, ousted as leader by a majority of his own MPs who voted him out in a secret ballot. O'Toole had pleaded with them to give him more time, but his enemies in the party have been sharpening their knives since losing the last election. And today, 73 of 119 caucus members turned against O'Toole. This was part of his message after that vote. Canada is in a dire moment of our history. You need only take a walk down the street in front of Parliament to see how divided we are. What Canadians deserve from a Conservative Party is balance, ideas and inspiration. O'Toole had warned the party it must choose either a negative extreme path or a more moderate one. That will now be up to the next leader to navigate. David Aiken is on top of all the developments tonight. David? Well, Donna, in the end, it was not close. Nearly two-thirds of the 119 MPs in Aaron O'Toole's caucus voted to show him the door. Caucus spoke pretty convincingly, and we're going to move on, we're going to find a new, new leader. We needed a, a new captain to bring us all together, and I think it was time for a change, and uh, the majority of our grassroots movement felt that that was uh, needed. It wasn't quick. MPs debated for three hours in a virtual closed-door meeting while protesters honked outside their Parliament Hill offices. Insiders say O'Toole spoke twice. He offered to meet with caucus dissidents and move a leadership review that had been scheduled for August 2023 up, but it was to no avail. O'Toole delivered a parting statement on Facebook. Hear the other side. Listen to all voices, not just the echoes from your own tribe. Realize that our country is divided and people are worried. He did not meet reporters Wednesday, nor did he attend question period where, had he done so, he would have heard his chief opponent, the Prime Minister, pay tribute to his work. There is a, a lot we don't agree on for the direction of this country, uh, but he stepped up to serve his country, and I want to thank him uh, for his sacrifice. Thoughts now turn to O'Toole's replacement. I think we have some incredible, great, strong people. Candice Bergen, Michelle Rempel gardner Pierre Polyev. Uh, any other, one of those three right now would be uh, my picks. Poiliev is an Ontario MP who served in Stephen Harper's cabinet. He's a Conservative fan favourite. We'll see what happens, but uh, I, I hope Pierre Poiliev puts his name forward, and if he does, I would support him 100%. The big thing that we need is we need unity in our party right now. That means a bit of a, a, bit of a strong hand at the tiller. But insiders say that until the party's governing National Council sets the rules, sets the spending limits and, crucially, sets a date, it's too early to speculate who will run. Now, the immediate order of business is to pick an interim leader. At least three MPs want that job, and the Tory caucus meets this evening to sort that one out. Donna? All right, David Aiken in Ottawa, thank you. The anger and the blockades in downtown Ottawa and at the U.S.-Canada border in, the, in southern Alberta have carried on for another day. Though in Coots, Alberta tonight, where protesters have blocked the road near a busy border crossing for five days, there appears to be some progress. We'll get to that in just a moment. But first, to the nation's capital. Police say about 250 people remain, and the trucks and the honking and the intimidation of people continues to impact essential services and businesses. Ottawa police call the situation highly volatile and say the protesters are getting funding and organizational help from American supporters. There are lots of questions about why the city and the police haven't taken more action to end the disruption. 
As Abigail Beeman reports, the trucks and protesters who are still there say they're digging in for the long haul. Street hockey in front of the Supreme Court of Canada. Dancing Santa, a couple of anti-Semitic signs and horn blasts all day long. Many who call Ottawa home and don't live in the middle of the road have had enough. These people are uh, taking our freedom away to promote their own brand of freedom and uh, I don't think that's fair. Get rid of them. You hear it down there? That's where I live. Frustrated police won't move in to get protesters out. What I'm seeing is the blatant hypocrisy in the way that they're treating a largely white demonstration versus a black and indigenous organization. I'm sorry for the living hell that you are enduring. During an update from police, councillors across the city expressed concern. Police said the situation is now somewhere between a demonstration and a long-term effort to occupy the streets. All options are being discussed, including military aid, but no specific plan put forward. All such options come with significant risks. Risks to rioting, risks to injury, and risk to death. Three people have been arrested and charged, and police say multiple investigations are ongoing, with more protesters expected to join this weekend. The police chief wouldn't answer how long this could last. There may not be a policing solution to this demonstration. He says there is a significant American component to the protest and its significant funding. The GoFundMe campaign has surpassed $10 million. Late Wednesday, it was paused. A message reads it's under review to ensure it complies with applicable laws. I don't know how long this is going to last, but try two years of losing your job, not knowing if you're going to lose your home. 2023, 2024, I'm here for the debate. I can't work. I can't work. I can't go stateside. Police pegged the costs of all this at $3 million and growing. Compare that to the cost of the entire Canada 150 event on the Hill. It cost less than half. The price tag here, upwards of $800,000 a day. And that doesn't include the other impacts to the city and the economy. The Rideau Centre, for example, a major downtown mall, has said it will stay closed until next week. Donna? All right, Abigail Beeman in Ottawa tonight. Thanks. There are signs of a breakthrough tonight in Coots, Alberta, after days of disruption near the U.S. border. Our Heather Yorks West is there and joins me now. Heather, what's happening tonight? Donna, I can tell you that the situation here looks a lot different than it did earlier today. Protesters have moved their vehicles to the shoulders, opening up a lane of traffic in both directions, though RCMP say that travel is still not recommended quite yet. Still, it is a very hopeful sign here after a very tense few days. This is what we're trying to get through. Oh my God! Cell phone video captures the moment of impact. Coots resident Tara Chamber had just left town to get groceries when she was hit. It was terrifying, absolutely terrifying. The crash happened Tuesday afternoon as RCMP moved in to try and dismantle the illegal blockade at the Coots border crossing. Police warned protesters that if they did not leave peacefully, arrests would follow. A few did leave, but then... We had... Um, a bunch of vehicles and, and farm machinery that were to the north at a roadblock that was set up on Highway 4 to the north. Those vehicles breached the roadblock and they did that by um, driving at quite high speeds. It was one of those vehicles that hit Tara Chambers' car. Police say her husband was then assaulted before the driver left the scene. All we were doing was going to go get groceries. And they're trying to say that this is a peaceful protest not very peaceful to me. On Tuesday, Alberta's Premier urged protesters to end the blockade while calling for calm. Anybody who feels sympathetic uh, to those engaged in this blockade, please uh, stay away from the area. Uh, please do not uh, further intensify an, an already difficult situation. Uh, the police have a job to do. Beyond the RCMP checkpoint, several dozen protest vehicles gathered Wednesday. Their drivers telling Global News they've come in a show of support for those still here. Our intention remains to, to restore movement of goods and vehicles on the road, but not at the risk of public safety. 
An RCMP tell me that that uh, group of protesters beyond the RCMP checkpoint to the north of here has grown in size. So that is something that RCMP are still watching very closely right now. But again, some hopeful signs as this uh, blockade uh, is in its fifth day. Donna? All right, Heather Urex West near the U.S.-Alberta border. There are some significant developments tonight in the tensions over Ukraine. Britain confirms it has intercepted and escorted four Russian bomber aircraft that it says were approaching UK airspace. Jets were scrambled from a military airfield in northern Scotland after unidentified aircraft were spotted. The Royal Air Force says four Russian Bear aircraft were intercepted. They did not enter UK airspace. And the U.S. is deploying thousands of troops to Eastern Europe, on top of the thousands of soldiers already on standby in the region. Washington and Moscow are still in a stalemate over Ukraine. There's little sign of a diplomatic path forward. And tonight, leaked documents reveal NATO's terms to try to get the Russian president to step back from the brink of war. Jackson Prosko reports. New satellite images suggest Russia has further bolstered its military presence near Ukraine. The West is now responding in kind, with an American carrier strike group in the region and thousands of U.S. troops en route to Russia's doorstep. It's important that we send a strong signal to Mr. Putin and frankly to the world that NATO matters to the United States. It, made, it matters to our allies. The U.S. will redeploy 1,000 troops currently stationed in Germany to Romania. Another 2,000 troops will be dispatched from the U.S., most to Poland and some to Germany. None will be placed directly in Ukraine. It's all meant to send a message that the West isn't backing down. Problem is, neither is Russia. Russia's security concerns are mostly bluff and bluster, but Russia's desire to protect and preserve its sphere of influence is in integral to its self-image as a country and to also Putin's uh, geopolitical legacy. A Spanish newspaper obtained the written responses to Vladimir Putin's security demands. In them, the U.S. and NATO offered to negotiate new disarmament treaties if Russia de-escalates in the region. There are no concessions on Putin's insistence that NATO claw back from Eastern Europe and bar new member states like Ukraine. A failure of the West in Ukraine will send a message across the globe that the West is incapable of defending its core principles and thus incapable of defending itself. During a Wednesday phone call, British Prime Minister Boris Johnson warned Putin that an invasion would be a tragic miscalculation. The next move is Russia's to make. The Biden administration insists the new troop deployment is consistent with what the U.S. has already told Russia. It's about combat readiness and about reassuring nervous NATO allies who've seemed uncertain about confronting the Russian threat. Donna? Jackson Prosco in Washington, thanks. Gearing up for the Winter Games in Beijing. Coming up, the celebrations and the controversies in China. Let's welcome our Canadian team flag bearers, Marie-Philippe Poulain and Charles Amelin. Those two Canadian athletes are getting a special honour. They will carry the flag at Friday's opening ceremony of the Winter Olympics. Women's hockey captain Marie-Philippe Poulain and speed skating star, star Charles Amelin will share the honour. She is a two-time Olympic champion and he has won five medals, including three gold. Well, the upcoming games are expected to be one of the most complicated and controversial in history. Not only will athletes be competing under strict COVID-19 protocols, as Eric Sorensen explains, they'll also be navigating politics, human rights and free speech. The torch relay has begun, a sign of the growing festive spirit before every Olympics. And a big moment for the Canadian team, the flag bearers were revealed. Charles Amelin is a five-time Olympian with three speed skating gold medals. And Marie-Philippe Poulain has won gold twice in hockey. I am very happy. It's a lot of pride in that moment. It's something that we look for for four years. And it's like a little gift that people gave us. Friday's opening ceremony will give the Games an upbeat start. But these Olympics will arrive with perhaps less global enthusiasm than ever before. The COVID pandemic has imposed severe restrictions on athletes, cutting off Olympic visitors from seeing and showing off the host country. And for many, China's conduct has created a cloud over the usual joy that precedes the Games. Happy 
In several countries, protests have condemned China, from its treatment of the mostly Muslim Uyghur population to its crackdown on pro-democracy activists in Hong Kong. China is using the Olympics to restore its image, says this advocate, to hide its terrible human rights record. This debate around the human rights record of China has not gone away at all. If anything, it's increasing because of the restrictions uh, that have been put on media coverage and on athletes uh, expressing their own opinions about things. Canada joined a diplomatic boycott of the Beijing Games. No government officials will be there. The Canadian Olympic Committee just wants the athletes to compete. Well, we certainly respect the government's right to have made that decision, but we believe it's important to be here. The power of sport comes from the bringing together as opposed to the isolation. Emphasizing sport, the IOC avoids political confrontation. Uh, thanks uh, to uh, our uh, gracious uh, Chinese hosts. Once the Olympic competition begins, politics often seem to melt away. But images of China's President Xi Jinping, expected to welcome guests like Russia's Vladimir Putin, will be reminders that current international tensions are not far removed from these Olympic Games. Eric Sorensen, Global News, Toronto. The once COVID-free island of Tonga is now in complete lockdown after two port workers tested positive for the virus. The Pacific nation is still recovering after last month's deadly volcanic eruption and tsunami. Officials had feared foreign aid deliveries might spread the virus. It's not clear how the two port workers became infected, though authorities say several other people on the island have also since tested positive. Ahead, as a winter storm wallops parts of the U.S., the groundhogs weigh in with their predictions. Take a look at this aborted landing at London's Heathrow Airport on Monday. High winds buffeted this British Airways plane. It bounced, it tilted to one side, and its tail actually hit the runway before it took off again. The pilot tried a second time and did manage to touch down successfully minutes later. At the time, a storm had been battering the UK with winds of up to 144 kilometers an hour. In the US, nearly 100 million Americans are under winter storm warnings tonight. Weather alerts are in place in more than a dozen states from New Mexico to Maine. The storm system is packing heavy snow, freezing rain and strong winds. And it could last several days. There's concern it could be the biggest storm of the season. Storm warnings are also in place for much of a southern Ontario, Quebec, and Atlantic Canada. And because it is February 2nd, we have to check in with the authorities on weather predictions, the Groundhogs. Willie says it's an early spring. Oh, wow, yes, early spring. Everybody. Well, that's what we like to hear. Ontario's Wyerton Willie saw no shadow and predicts spring is just around the corner. That optimism, though, is not universal. Both Nova Scotia's Shubenacadie Sam and Quebec's Fred La Marmotte saw their shadows. So if you believe them, it's six more weeks of winter. And at Gobbler's Knob, Pennsylvania, Puxatawney Phil saw his shadow, too. So I think I'll go with Wyerton Willie. This year's nominees for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame were announced today, and Dolly fans will be happy. Dolly Parton could soon add the prestigious honor to her many awards and accomplishments. There are 17 nominees in total, including Lionel Richie, Eminem, and Rage Against the Machine. The final list of inductees will be announced in May. Here's some more Dolly. We're back in a moment. Well, we often showcase the legacy of famous sports stars, musicians, and politicians when they die, but there are, of course, millions of other people who have led meaningful lives. Jeffrey Hutchings was one of those people. He was a professor of evolutionary ecology at Dalhousie University, and he died this week at the age of 63. He was a world-class scientist, a fierce advocate of protecting science from political interference, and as Ross Lord reports, he was also a remarkable mentor. If life can be measured by the things people say about us after we're gone, 
Jeffrey Hutchings' life was superb. I wouldn't be where I am now if it wasn't for Jeff, his guidance, and him taking a risk on me. As a professor at Dalhousie University, Hutchings was known for educating students about fisheries entirely from his head. No need for notes or PowerPoints. As a fisheries scientist, he was legendary for his integrity and his dedication. He didn't want to be popular, he just wanted the right decision to be made that was for the best interests of society, for conservation, for sustainability. Hutchings' love of the sea was instilled during visits to Newfoundland and Labrador as a child. It was a Newfoundland-based crisis, the collapse of the northern cod fishery, where Hutchings first rose to prominence, courageously standing up to the Federal Department of Fisheries and Oceans and accusing it of mismanagement. Jeff Hutchings went out on a limb, and he called them out for it. He wrote a paper with two uh, more senior colleagues. A bold move by someone who was still a graduate student. He was just honestly one of the most amazing humans and kind people that I've ever met. For protege Sean Godwin, the shock of his mentor dying unexpectedly at age 63 is still fresh, but his spirits are lifted, recalling Hutchings' character. He fought tirelessly to separate science from politics. An iron curtain is being drawn by government between science and society. Closed curtains, especially those made of iron, make for very dark rooms. And he made a difference for consumers as the independent science advisor for the grocery giant Loblaw. He said that it was one of the most impactful things he ever did because sometimes within hours after he made the advice, Loblaw would change its, its seafood lineup. At a time when science is under siege from the misinformed, friends and colleagues say there's even more reason to commemorate people like Jeffrey Hutchings. And in this world, we need a lot more Jeff, that's for sure. Ross Lord, Global News, Halifax. And that is Global National for this Wednesday. I'm Donna Friesen. Tonight's Your Canada is this wintry view of the Saskatchewan Legislature in Regina. There are beautiful spots all over this country. Please email us yours to viewers at globalnational.com. Thanks for watching. Hope to see you here again tomorrow. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye.